Hey guys, Freddy here. Welcome back to another Retro RPG. Now, normally I'd be saying at the end of another week and the end of another poll, but this is the same old poll that I've been running because I've just come back from my holidays. So I've only just put up a new poll this morning, so it hasn't had a chance to run, so we've not seen the results. But what I did before I went away on holiday was ran a larger poll and we've done the top three results from that. So the first one was the Conan role-playing game, which we did two weeks ago. Then last week we did the Star Wars Edge of the Empire role-playing game, and this week we're doing Toon, the cartoon role-playing game. Now this is going to be a PDF review, so we're going over to the computer desktop in a wee second and having a look at that. But as usual, I'll be back at the end of the video, some other channel-related stuff, and some stuff about the new poll that's just come up. But before I do that, I'd like to take a moment to talk about my patrons, who are wonderful, wonderful people who make all of this possible, and their efforts are really appreciated. Now if you'd like to join them and help support the channel, and I sure wish you would, or you'd like to see these videos a week early, or you'd like to see one of the other levels of patronage we've got, then the Patreon's in the description down below. If you check it out, it'd be very much appreciated. Anyway, let's have a look at Toon, the cartoon role-playing game. So this is Toon, the cartoon role-playing game from Steve Jackson Games, and it came out in 1984. Now it's written by Greg Costigan and Warren Spector. Now, Warren Spector has gone on to have a very highly regarded career in video games. While he did a lot of role-playing stuff after doing Toon, he also has gone on to be responsible for things like the Deus Ex game, which is massively respected within video games for having so many options. And Greg Costigan is one of my favourite RPG authors. He did the fantastic violence role-playing game, which is kind of a study on the violence within role-playing games, but absolutely hilarious at the same time. And he did things like Paranoia, Price of Freedom, games which have a very good sense of humour, respecting that role-playing games are games and therefore supposed to be fun. So I really like Greg Costigan's stuff. Now, Toon is a role-playing game of cartoons. So, your Saturday morning cartoons, your Bugs Bunny, your um, Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner, your da uh, Wacky Races, Tom and Jerry, all of these things. Things where s crazy things happen to characters, the action's fast-paced and doesn't necessarily make sense. Things where a character can get run over by a road roller, squashed flat, and be back in the next scene. And this game emulates that. But anyway, let's have a look at the back cover. So, be a cartoon star. Remember all those great cartoons you used to watch every Saturday morning? Now they're on again, and you're the star. Toon lets you be a rabbit, duck, moose, moose... Mouse moose, sorry. Woodpecker, wombat, crocodile, caveman, whatever you want. Toon brings you a world where crazy animals talk, fight, carouse, and act silly. Being punched, blown up, steamrolled? Don't worry, you'll bounce back in the next scene, ready for more. Toon is a quick, simple, and fun. Ready to get silly? Get in tune and be a cartoon star. Steve Jackson Games. Inside, um, if I can get to the front, it's nice cartoony graphics, very reminiscent of Paranoia and other Greg Costigan games, but laid out in a very particular Steve Jackson uh, way. If you showed me this game without letting me know it was a Steve Jackson game, I think I could probably guess, because of the way it's laid out. Um, it looks very, very familiar to anybody who's looked through GURPS and the like. So, we start off with Chapter 1, Welcome to Toon. Toon is set in a crazy world of cartoons. In this world, anything can happen. Um, a special message for experienced role players. Basically saying, forget all the things you tend to respect in other role-playing games, you tend to consider, and just go with this game. You know, survival and preserving your life doesn't matter. You cannot die in tune. You can only get squashed and you're out for three minutes. And then you're back with full heal hit points. So trying things which lead to certain death is definitely a way of playing tune, especially if it's funny. Um... Forget everything you know and act before you think. What the heck does that mean? And it talks you through role-playing stuff. So, the dice, what characters are, what attributes are, the character sheet. Um, talking about the different attributes there. So you've got muscle, which is your strength. Smarts, which are your intelligence. Koopa, which is your charm, your um, exuberance. And zip, which is your speed, your um, agility. Getting started. So it talks through skills, 
how fighting works, um, including an example for the character Mac the Mouse, which features throughout doing damage, taking damage and falling down. Um, falling down, see, we've got a bunch of cartoon cats here timed out, all nine lives, just waiting three minutes until they can be back in play. We've got other skills, so running, throwing, talks about racing and chasing, throwing and dodging. And we've got dodging, fast talking, how to resist fast talk, firing guns, plot points, um, the animator, which is the fancy name for Games Master. I'm never keen on using different ones, but it kind of makes sense for the anima the person to be in charge of a game of Toon to be the animator. Although I kind of would have liked them to have been a different character. Animator, to me, is somebody who can get involved in the story from time to time. The way that Stan Lee and Jack Kirby would sometimes show up in their comic strips, the Marvel ones, and you would get a hand sort of appearing in Tiny Toons and that kind of thing. Um... And then we're on to the first adventure. We're on to page 12, and we're into an adventure already, just using what we've already been taught. Now, while there's more to the game to come, this is getting us into using what we've already learned. So, it's the Cartoon Olympics. Basically, the characters are competing in a number of sports, um, and they're trying to win the most, and whoever wins, wins a car. So, we've got... Um, the plot, opening scene, and first of all we've got a boxing match, so we're using the fighting skills. Then we've got the javelin toss, so we're using the throwing skills. We've got the marathon, so we're using running skills. And then we've got the big finish, which talks about whoever wins gets the car. The loser can try and fast talk them out of it, but whoever drives off in the car will find it falling apart in a cartoon style as bits fall off as they go into the distance. We've got character creation. So creating a character. Now the different attributes it talks them through. We've got a list of different species you might want to roll on. Um, different occupations if you want to go randomly. And we've got beliefs and goals. What motivates the character? Um, how to use beliefs and goals in play. What possessions they might have. You know, whether they might have a big baseball bat they carry in their back pocket. Whatever. Um, then we've got how to do everything. So it talks through the skills. We've got sh uh, skills and shticks. Shticks are special abilities. So we've got the ordinary skills. Muscle skills, you can break down doors, you can climb, you can fight, you can pick up heavy things, you can throw. Zip skills, so you've got dodge, drive vehicle, fire gun, um, jump, ride, run, swim. We've got smart skills, so hide, spot, hidden, identify dangerous things, read, resist, fast talk, see, hear, smell, set or disarm trap, track or cover tracks. And we've got cut skills, so fast talk, pass, detect, shoddy goods, sleight of hand, sneak. And then we've got shticks, so we've got things like bag of many things. You've got a pocket or a bag that you can reach into and pull almost anything out of. Unless it doesn't work, because there are rules for that. You've got the ability to change shape or detect an item. You can fly, you can hypnotise people. You've got incredible speed. So you are the roadrunner, like that. Incredible strength. You've got quick change in disguise, teleport, incredible luck. And, of course, others were introduced in other source books later on. Then we've got fine-tuning. So it talks about where get adventures might be set. Oh, I didn't expect that to happen. Just roll dice, see what happens. It's supposed to be fun, it's supposed to be silly. Um, illogical logic. So if you can make something make sense, then it works. It doesn't matter if it wouldn't work in real life. This is a cartoon and it's not supposed to work like real life. Um, cause and effect. Um, cartoon coincidences. Boggling. Characters and non-characters. Inanimate objects. So we talk about things here like independent shadows, so shadows which do their own things. Instant fine print on documents, so you've signed a document but then they reveal that there's extra fine print. Um, sawing, uh, sawing holes or sawing through branches, so when you stood on a branch and you cut it and it hovers there for a moment before dropping. Moving in toon time, passing out plot points, different gimmicks. Um, how to become the perfect games master or animator. 
the final fade out, how to end your stories. And it's style talking about other things, you know, erasers, where you might erase other characters. And um, flag guns, so you pull the trigger and just a flag comes out saying bang. And uh, pen, pencil, brush, where you can draw things into existence. And then we're on to yet more adventures. We're only on page 44. We've gone through all the rule stuff. And now it's just going to give us a bunch more adventures. Because you're supposed to be into play for it quickly. So, the Cartoon Olympic Strike Back. So it talks about expanding the adventure, adding plot complications. I fugled you, where you have to travel to darkest Africa to bring back the fugle bird. And you're hired by a rich man, you go to his palatial mansion, you're in darkest Africa, and there's various um, encounters in darkest Africa. The monkey bars, um, tigers, danger signs. And the Fugal Clearing. We've got Spaced Out Saps. So the players are members of the Space Aeronautic, Aeronautics Patrol Squad, or Saps. They have been selected to take a trip to the moon, where they encounter some Martians and a Martian dog, who are mining the moon for its cheese. So all kind of silly stuff. We've got little green pills, the Martians gadgets, the moon cheese and the effects it has on different Martians, the purple guard dog, leading up to the big finish and plot points. And we've got the better house trap. It's getting cold, the players want somewhere to stay in the winter and they hear about a experimental house on the edge of town, so they're going to go it, to it. But it's got all sorts of guarding guard things, a high fence and um, different defenses. So you've got to break into it, you're exploring, we've got some maps of the house here, the robot storage core, um, and what happens in the different rooms as you explore the house and different robots and defences go against you. Assembly line saunas, leading up to the big finish with a mechanical dog involved. There's some charts for random items and animals, random traps, an index, and that's us through. It, including the covers, it's 66 pages. But those 66 pages are absolutely packed. There's loads of wonderful stuff in here. I've played Toon a number of times, way back in the 80s, and had an absolutely great time. Um, one of the players was a brilliant artist, and he drew out our characters for them, for us, and he also could do an impression of Marvin the Martian. So that's what he played. While we all played um, various characters, some of them ripped off from other places, some of them we made up ourselves, but he played Marvin the Martian and did the voice, and we had an absolute great time. Continuing adventures, um, silly stuff happening, you know, leaping into TVs to get away from villains in the room, etc., etc. Fantastic stuff. So that was Toon, the cartoon role-playing game, and that came third in the poll that we ran a few weeks ago. Obviously, we've done the other, the number one and two, since then. But that's us finally done with that poll. I'm back from my holidays, and a new poll is up, and it's a Retro Adventures one. And I've kind of gone for a bunch of stuff that I want to make videos on, which never do particularly well. So this poll's probably not going to be as popular as the last one, but we'll get this out of the way, and I'll get to make a video on an adventure I really want to talk about. So, first up, we've got Tales from the Ether for Space 1889, came out from Games Designers Workshop in 1989. Now this is a bunch of different adventures set across the solar system in that steampunk game. You've got an adventure on Venus, one on Mercury, one on Mars, one on the Moon, and one in a space station orbiting around Earth. So you really get to explore the universe of this steampunk world where you've got sailing ships going through space and all that. Fantastic stuff. Second up, we've got San Francisco Knights for Cyborg Commando. Now, Cyborg Commando was one of the games that Gary Gygax did after he less left TSR. So he wasn't doing Dungeons & Dragons anymore, and he came out with this game. And it's a bit of a disaster. But perhaps the adventures redeem it. So if it wins, we will get a chance to see whether this bad game, considered one of the worst, actually had some excellent adventures. We shall see. After that, we've got Nightwalker the Villy Affair for Millennium's End. Now, Millennium's End is one of my favourite role-playing games. It's so well done. Chameleon Eclectic did 
fantastic publishing, really high quality stuff, and wrote some fantastic um, source books and adventures for it. And these never do well in the poll, but I really want to create videos on them, so it's back up and we shall see if it wins this time. These are two adventures I've run and had a great time with. After that, we've got your own private Idaho for Price of Freedom. Now, Price of Freedom was something I really wanted for a long time. I bought it myself as a gift for getting 1,000 subscribers way back when. It's on the shelf behind me somewhere, a nice big red box, and I absolutely adore it. But it wasn't heavily supported. There was only one source book and one adventure for it, and I would love to cover that adventure. So, it's up. If it wins, let's have a look through this glorious air uh, game. Some fantastic stuff in there, I hope. And finally, we've got the Key of Deliriad for Slay Industries. Now, Slay Industries is my local game. It was written by some Scotsmen in Paisley, which is about 25 miles in that direction from where I'm sitting. It's the local game. It's local guys done good. They've moved house since, and now they're in um, Cumnock, I believe, which is about 20 miles in that direction. They've kind of passed me by as they've moved around. But these are local guys, and as that, I really like this game. It has a mindset that I feel is very Scottish, even though it's a sort of cyberpunk sci-fi game. But, again, they didn't publish many adventures for it, so it would be a joy to look through the adventure and see what they saw and the way they saw people playing their game. Anyway, what else have I been up to? Well, I've been putting some new stuff up on DriveThruRPG. I put up the 5th edition compatible version of Legends of the Small Folk, my role-playing game about anthropomorphic mice and hedgehogs and other small creatures adventuring around the human realm. A bit watership down, I suppose, but they are actually people and they carry weapons and equipment. It's just that people don't see them as that. So there's the 5th edition rules uh, compatible version of that up on DriveThruRPG because I wanted to give it a rule system that more people would understand and perhaps give the game more exposure through that. We shall see. Also, I put up a bunch of monsters for Dungeons & Dragons in the past few weeks, which are basically versions of liches. So, the lich is a wizard who has taken their power and extended it into unlife. But I wondered about the other classes. So I have done versions of virtually every class out of Dungeons & Dragons and made their own undead version. Paladins who have given their faith and given their life over to their gods and had extended lives for that, but lost their personalities in the uh, meantime. Bards who have told stories so epic that they live on with the stories they've told. And as I said, I've done all the different classes, you know, druids which have become staunch defenders of the wilderness and lived on becoming part of nature themselves, etc, etc. I think these were really interested and I was kind of thought they were lacking from Dungeons & Dragons in the past. So I had a lot of fun putting these together. But they're up on DriveThruRPG, and of course freely accessible to any patron of Librarian or Laird status. And if you want to gain access to the shared Google Drive with all of that on, then the patrons in the description down below. Over on RPG Gamer, well obviously I took a break while I was away, but that's me started back up with the Knights of the Old Republic comics. We've got about 10 issues to go before the end, so we're going to go through those. I'll catch up with the other comics that I usually cover, and then we've got more stuff coming up because we've got the Young Jedi Adventures series, 25 more episodes of that to cover. Loads and loads of stuff to do for the Star Wars D6 system. If you're interested in that, then check us out over on RPGGamer.org. But anyway, as usual, I've been wittering on for way too long, so thank you very much for watching. As always, most of all, you look after yourselves, and I'll catch you later. Bye now.